First Chronicles, chapter number 16. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 1. And I'm going to do just a little bit of skipping around until we get to the place that God wants us to home in on. Um, but it's going to be found in First Chronicles. Uh, an Old Testament historical book. Chapter number 16. And I want to begin reading it in uh, verse number 1. First Chronicles 16 and 1 is our starting point. When you have it, so praise the Lord. Amen. Um, and it reads, So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. And when David had made an end of offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Verse number seven. Then on that day, David delivered first this psalm to the thanks, to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talking of all his wonderful, wondrous works. Glory he in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continuously. One translation said, look to the Lord and his strength and seek his face always. Seek his face always. I want to preach on the subject today. Aim for his face. Aim for his face. Aim for his face. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, what you need to do is aim for his face. Amen. Aim for his face. This is an interesting concept that the Holy Spirit has been given to me, has been given to me by the Holy Spirit. To pinpoint an issue where most of the church is going wrong at. One of the church's greatest issues of this generation is wrong objectives. <clears throat> It is because of wrong objectives that so many people are not seeing the hand of God move in their lives. I'm going to take my time with this. It's because of wrong objectives that so many people are not seeing uh, the hand of God move in their lives. It's absolutely amazing to me how a group of people can go to the same church work on the same job, or go to the same school and yet experience different outcomes. It's mind-boggling to me. And it's just, it, it reminds me of the incident when Peter jumped off the boat and walked on the water to Jesus in Matthew 14 and 28. All of the disciples were on the same boat and yet Peter experienced something different from all the other disciples. The reason why he experienced something different from the other disciples was because he was aiming at something different. And what he was aiming for caused him to experience the power of God. Watch this now. In this text, David learned a valuable lesson. He learned a valuable lesson. He learned the importance of um, seeking the face of God. Yes, yes. I, I, I mean, he learned the, 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 the importance of seeking the face of God. Unlike this generation that we are living in now, who don't know the importance of seeking 
the face of God, who don't know the power associated with seeking the face of God. David was overwhelmed with the revelation knowledge that come from the process. He, he was overwhelmed with the revelation knowledge of the process of seeking the face of God. In other words, there is a lesson to be learned in seeking the face of God. There's, there's a lesson. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, there is a lesson to be learned in seeking the face of God. Here's the thing. With most people uh, who come to church today, uh, they, they come to God, watch this now, aiming for his hand. They come to God aiming for his hand. When you, listen, when you aim for his hand, you are shooting at the wrong objective. I want to say this again. When you come to church aiming for his hand, you are shooting at the wrong objective. Aiming for his hand will not cause you to experience the hand of God. Say this again. I want to say this again. Aiming for his hand will not cause you to experience the hand of God. Write this down. I need you to write this down. Seeking his face is a prerequisite of experiencing the hand of God. I want to say it again. Seeking his face is the prerequisite of experiencing the hand of God. Here's why seeking his face is so important. Seeking his face is a common translation of his presence. Seeking his face is the Hebraic way of having access to God. So to be to be before his face is to be in his presence. And his face is what you should be aiming for and not his hand. So when you are seeking his hand, therefore you will never experience the hand of God moving in your life. It's because the power is not in his hand, it's in his face. Yeah. Write this down too. I need you to write this down too. His hand won't move if his face can't see you. This is why it's so important to seek his face because his hand won't move if he can't see you. He, got, he has to see you, so you have to aim for his face because his face is the access point to his power. His hand is not the access point. His face is the access point. And when you seek his face, you have access to his power and his hand. Oh, I wish I had witness up in here this morning because some of you, you've been, you've been operating out by the wrong objective and you've been shooting for his hand, but I'm here to tell you right now, uh -uh, that's wrong, baby. You need to stop shooting for his hand and start shooting for his face. His face is the access point to his power. And when you get, and if you want to get God's attention, you got to seek his face. Watch this now. And then, after that, you must understand that you've got to have the right ammunition to get his attention. No, See, it's a, it's a combination of some things. See, you've got, to, you've got to seek his face because there's an access point. But on the other hand, on the other side of this thing, after you seek his face, you've got to have the right ammunition to get his attention. Oh my God, I wish I had a witness up in here. It's important to understand that God sets his face only on the righteous. He sets his face only on the righteous. In other words, God's face is not made available for everybody. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to Psalms 34, verse number 15. Y'all follow with me. As uh, Y'all follow me. Uh, Psalms 34, verse number 15. Psalms 34, verse number 15. Wow, this is good stuff here. Psalms 34, verse number 15. I want you to get that. I want you to see this. It's important to understand that God sets his face only to the righteous. And I'm going to give you the biblical proof to validate what I'm saying in Psalms 34 and 15. Look what he says in Psalms 34 and 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Oh, my God. Now, watch this now. He said that the face of the Lord is against those 
who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous crowd and the Lord hears and deliver them out of all their troubles. In other words, he said he have a problem. See, and you must understand something. When people, when, 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 when God sees people engaging in habitual sin, he hides his face from them. If you ever want to cause God to hide his face, start sinning. Because the moment you start sinning is when God turns his face from us. And this is something you definitely don't want to see because once he hides his face, you lose the access point to his power and his hand. And evidently David knew this because he referred to this in one of his songs. Let's go to another portrait we'll talk. David knew this because he referred to this in one of his psalms. In, in Psalms uh, uh, 27 and 9. David said this in Psalms 27 and 9. I want you to go to 27 and 9. Turn over just a few pages to Psalms 27 and look at verse number 9. This is what David says here in Psalms 27 and 9. Don't hide your face from me. Don't do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave nor leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Then he says again in Psalms 102 and 2, do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily. I need you to understand something. It's with his face. That God hear us and see us. So he don't he can't see you from his hand. He only see you from his face. In other words, the key to our very existence is to stay in his presence, to stay in his face. So you, you it's important that you stay in his presence by staying in his face. Seeking his face is the prerequisite of the power of God, the, of the prerequisite of the hand of God. So the power is not in the hand, the power is in his face. Watch this now. Oftentimes, this is the issue. This is the problem why so many people don't see the hand of God moving in their favor. That they don't see it moving in their favor is because God has hidden his face from some of us. From some of us. He has hidden his face. When we are living in sin or our lives are out of order, it causes God to hide his face from us. So it's two things that causes God to hide his face. Number one is sin, and number two is when your life is out of order. See, a lot of people don't understand this. They don't want, they don't want this type of preaching, but this is the type of preacher that will help you in the long run. They don't want to hear that God turns his face when you are living in sin or your life is out of order. Here's, we must understand something. I want you to, I want you to understand this. God doesn't care if you're a sinner or a saint when you start sinning. He don't care if you're a sinner or a saint. The moment you or I begin to walk in habitual sin, God will hide him for his face. And I want to show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. Second Chronicles 7 and 14 is a very familiar passage of scripture. <laughs> very familiar passage of scripture. It reads, and I hear a lot of people quoting this, but they don't understand the dynamics of this. He said, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and what? Seek my face. Seek my, he didn't say seek my hand and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will heal from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Then, in other words, when we humble ourselves, repent and turn from sin, then and only then God will re re redirect his attention and turn his face in our direction. In other words, he is not going to turn his face in your direction if you insist on living a life of sin. Here's what David found out about God. David found out that good intentions never move the hand of God. I'm going to say this again. Good 
intentions never moves the hand of God. David found out that seeking his face is the only way to move the hand of God. See, there's a lot of people that come to church with good intentions, but good intentions don't get God to move his hand. See, see, when you look at 1 Chronicles 16, it is the aftermath of David's success of bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, which is called the city of David. So what you're looking at in verse number, chapter number 16 is the aftermath of, 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 of David's success of bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to the city of Jerusalem. But you don't know what it took David had to go through to get it back to the city of David, which was in Jerusalem. You don't know what it took. So what happened was, I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain it. I'm going to take my time a little bit. Woo. What happened was Israel had lost the Ark of the Covenant while in battle with the Philistines. And the Ark of the Covenant stayed in the land of the Philistines for seven months. Now watch this now. In seven months, God wreaked havoc in the land of the Philistines. Because you, but for, for, they wrecked havoc in the land of the Philistines for seven months. So for seven months, he hit them with plagues, he hit them with disease, and many of them died. So the leaders and the people of, uh, of, 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 of the Philistines decided to send the ark back to his rightful place. In other words, the ark of the presence of Jehovah Jireh do not, uh, 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 are supposed to be in the presence of the, in the land of the heathens. So what we got to do is get this ark out of our presence because this God is out of place and he's killing everything that's, that's stand before him until he get back into his proper place. So what they did the leaders and the people said look man, we're going to have to get the ark of the covenant out of here because if we don't get this covenant out of here, this ark out of here it's going to kill all of us. They're going not, not going to be none of us remaining because it's, the power is too strong but we need to do is get it out of here so what they did was they had sent it back to the land of Israel. And so what we're going to do, let's get some offerings, let's get some sacrifices, let's get a new, let's build a cart for it, let's get some, some new calves and let it just haul its way back to the land of Israel because we can't deal with that type of power among us. So they get it back and they send it back to the land of Israel. And eventually, the Ark of the Covenant ended up at a man's, a house named Abinadab. So when it gets to Abinadab house, according to 1 Samuel 17, I mean, uh, 7 and 1, uh, it, it, it arrives at Abinadab house. And not only do it arrives there, Abinadab is, 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 is blessed with the task of, of, of looking, to, to looking after the Ark of the Covenant of God. And the Bible said, according to 1 Samuel 7 and 2, that the Ark abode there at Abinadab's house for a long time. And the Bible said it, it abided there for 20 years. It, it abided there 20 years. The ark of the presence of God was at Abinadab house for 20 years. Now watch out now. I want you to understand something. When Saul became king, he never tried to retrieve it. But when David became king, his intentions was to retrieve the ark of God, to receive the ark of the covenant of God and bring it into the city of David, which brings us to 2 Samuel 6 and 1, or 1 Chronicles 13 and 3. The Bible said David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel at 30,000, and verse number 3 of that chapter 13 of 1 Chronicles said, and let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquire not at it in the days of Saul. One translation said, and let us bring back the ark of our God, for we have been neglecting it ever since Saul became king. He said, so we got to bring it back because we've been neglecting the Ark of the Covenant. And David knew how important it was to have the Ark with him because the Ark symbolizes the presence of God. And he said, in order for my kingdom to be blessed, I need the presence of God to be among my kingdom. See, I wish I had a witness up in here that you want your, your house blessed because of the presence. You want your business blessed. You need the presence of God. Whatever you're trying to do, you need the presence of God with you. David understood that I need the, I need the ark to be in the city of David because as long as the presence of God is among this kingdom, we're going to succeed and be successful. 
And the Bible said in verse number four of this, uh, sec, I mean in First Chronicles 13, verse number four, then all the assembly said that we would do so for the time was right in the eyes of all the people. Now verse number seven said, so they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadad and Uzzah and Ohio drove the car. Now I need you to understand something. Here's where it get tricky. They drove the car. They, they drove the car. In other words, they, 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 they uh, watched the direction of the car. And the Bible said in verse number nine, but something happened when they came to Chaldon's threshing floor. Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the ark stumbled. Amen. In other words, the ark stumbled. I want, you, I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Here, here's when it's going to get real interesting. And the Bible said after the ark stumbled, according to verse number uh, ten, 10, it said that then the anger of the Lord was aroused among against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died before God. So Uzzah died trying to catch the ark of God. And when he caught it, he died. This is why it says, this is why I say that good intentions never move the hand of God. You must understand that you and I, we serve a God of order. You, you, you need to understand something. You and I, we serve a God. The God that we serve is a God of order. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 14 and 4, let all things be done decently and in order. Write this down. I need you to write this down. God cares nothing about your intentions if the order is not right. Say it again. God cares nothing about your intentions if the order is not right. In other words, David's intentions was good, but he was totally out of order. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Mm. Mm. David's intention was good, but he was totally out of order. In other words, he didn't seek the face of God concerning this situation. But after Uzzah died, David started Seeking the face of God. Because he knew that his good intentions got somebody killed. And because Uzzah died, he said, wait a minute, I got to re-examine this thing. I got to go back and fact check. I got to go back and troubleshoot. I got to go see where did I went wrong. So he says, now I'm going to do this thing differently. I'm Instead of just moving off impulse, I'm going to go lay out before God and see how to straighten this thing out. So he says, I got to do it different now. Now I'm going to seek the face of God. And when David starts seeking the face of the Lord, he found out where they went wrong at. He found out where they went wrong at. And where they went wrong at is 1 Chronicles 15, verse 12. where they went wrong at. In verse number 15 and 12. This is y'all there? Go over just a chapter. It's right in fifth part right in front of you. And he said unto them, verse number 15, verse number uh, verse chapter number 15, verse number 12. And he said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both you and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord. God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because you did not at the first, because you didn't do it the first time, the Lord our God made a breach upon us. For that we ought we for that we sought him not after the due order. Other words, let me let me say this again. Let me read this from another translation. For because you did not do it the first time. The Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. 
So that's why I say he's the God of order. Your, your good intentions don't mean nothing when the order is off. And there's a lot of people that come to church that have good intentions and they'll never see the move of God, the hand of God, because you're not operating in the proper order. See, watch this now. The proper order or the due order was found right there in verse number 15. The children of Israel, of the Levites, bear the ark of God on their shoulders. In other words, now you got to check this out. God blew my mind. He gave me a revelation on this. And you got it, it, it's. In other words, he said, I'm going to show you where you went wrong. You were supposed to carry the presence of God on your shoulders and not push it around on the car. Here, 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 here's the thing. The, what they messed up was they was pushing around the glory of God. They were, and 15 and 15 said the better of, of the covenant of God on their shoulders. First Chronicles 13 and 7 said they carried out the ark of God on a new car. And God gave me a revelation. We must understand that the ark also represents his presence, right? And you got to watch out how you handle the presence of God. I'm going to tell you, watch this, watch this now. In other words, in other words, you got to watch out how you handle the presence of God because God don't want you pushing around his presence. Oh my God. And that's wrong with them wrong with some of the people in the church. They trying to push around the presence of God. And the presence of God was never created for you to push it. It was created for you to carry our somebody. Don't go, carry the presence of God. God said, I don't need you pushing me around, pushing my presence around. I want you to carry my presence on your shoulders. Because pushing around his presence, watch this, shows a lack of intimacy. When you are pushing around the presence of God, it shows a lack of intimacy between you and God. And when you are carrying the presence of God, it shows the level of intimacy between you and God. It's like those of you who have infants. When you push them around in the cart, that ain't intimacy. That's why sometimes the baby will start crying. Why the baby is crying? They cry, he's crying out because he wants to be carried. God said, I don't want you to push my presence around, but I want you to carry my presence on the altars of your heart. I need you to carry. There's a difference for pushing the presence. That's why, oh my God. There's so many people trying to push around the presence, but they're pushing around the presence shows a lack of intimacy but when you are carrying the presence of God it shows the level of intimacy between you and God because I'm carrying the presence of God with me I'm not pushing it it's in my heart it's on my shoulder it's all over me I didn't tell you to push me around I told you to carry me. I told you to carry me in the shoulders of your heart. So the moral of the incident is this. It's to aim for his face. So how do we aim for his face? We aim for his face by honoring and obeying his word. And a lot of people don't understand that it, there's a lot of people that's in the body of Christ are shooting a miss. Because in, word, in other words, you shooting in the air, you missing the target, you missing the face of God. Anytime you are operating in rebellion and disobedience, baby, you just shooting a miss. You ain't you missing his face because the only way you can seek his face, the only way you can hit the target is through honoring and obeying his word. show you what I'm talking about. Going back to 1 Chronicles 14 and 15. This is what he said. You got to go back to honoring and obeying his word. He says, so the priests 
Verse number 14 of that first Chronicle 15. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, God of Israel. And the children of the Levites, Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by his poles as Moses had commanded them according to the what? The word of the Lord. When they went to honoring and obeying and going by the due order, David was able to accomplish his mission on bringing the presence of God back to the city of David, which was in Jerusalem. And I'm here to tell you right now, the only way God's hand is going to move in our life is you got to shoot for his face. You got to aim for his face and stop aiming at his hand. In other words, that's why David said, going back to 1 Chronicles 16 and 10, glory ye in his name. Let the heart of them rejoice in the, uh, and that seek, the, uh, rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continuously. I'm done with it. He says, you have to seek his face always. Why, why, why do he tell us as the people of God to seek his face always? Because there'll be some times in your life when you get distracted. There'll be some times in your life where you'll get discouraged. And to be the truth of the matter, there'll be some times in your life where you lose faith. But he says, in order for you to get what you desire out of God, you got to seek his face continuously. Is it something easy? No. It's a challenge. But as you honor and obey the word of God, by and by, you will start to see his face. And the biggest problem with most people is they don't know how to get God's attention. But God said, what, when, you, when you get my attention, and, and how you get my attention is trying your best to live a holy life. Try your best to live righteously as possible. God said, now, nah, but you didn't caught my attention. You didn't caught my attention and I can't help but to because what you did, you, you pricked the access point to my power. I see you. I see what you're going through. I see what you're dealing with. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. And because you are trying to live right in spite of this perverse and crooked world because you are trying to live right even though you ain't going with the status quo and trying to do what everybody else do because you are trying to live right I see you and I hear you and I'm going to move on your behalf see there's benefits for seeking the face because when you get his face you got his favor See, I don't want his hand. I don't want his hand. His hand is just one aspect of it. But if I got your face, God, I, I got your attention. And not only do I got your hand, I got your heart. The Bible said that David was one not only to, to experience God's hand, but he experienced God's heart. The Bible said that David was, and Israel is, the apple of God's eye. In other words, his face is shining bright upon you. And when God's face is shining upon you, you have access to all the power. God will take a look at you and see your situation where you're going through, determine how you're going to move his hand. He said, because you've been praying, because you've been diligently, because you've been opening your Bible, because you've been fasting, because you've been seeking me now, I can't help but to move. Here's the power that you need. Here's the deliverance that you need. That hater on that job, I got to deal with. That, the, the one that's trying to come up against you, I got to deal with. I got to deal with because my eyes are on the righteous and my ears are open. 
until they cry. You better watch out how you handle God's righteous people. Because if they cried unto God and God find his face, shine his face upon them, it might be some real, real trouble. That's why the Lord tells us, watch this now. That's why the Lord tells us to pray for your enemies. The reason why he wants you to pray for your enemies is so that I won't do too much damage to them. That's why he also said, now, you ain't got to fight this battle now because vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and I shall repay. Now, what you need to be praying, that my, all of my wrath don't fall on this individual. And that's why he just said, Lord, have mercy on him. Have mercy on her. They're ignorant. Forgive her because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know that they're coming up against the God's anointed. They don't know that I'm the apple of your eye. They don't know it. But, Lord, please have mercy upon them. I'm going to show you that it's real. I'm going to show you that it's real. There was an incident in the book of Kings. When these 42 children was meddling and, 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 and making fun of the prophet named Elijah. And the Bible said that the Lord heard them talking about the man of God and sent two she bears to kill 42 children for putting their mouth on his prophet. So you got to be careful how you, how, you, have to, you have to be careful how you put your mouth on God anointed. That's why David said when he had the position to kill Saul, he said, no, I ain't going to kill Saul now because that was God's anointing. I'm not going to put my hands on him because he was once anointed by God. And because God had his hand on him at one time in his life, I'm going to leave that alone. Aim for his face, church. And stop aiming for his hand. But when you shoot him in the face, you shoot him with that obeying and honoring his word. And that right there just gravitates. to God. God face gravitates to honoring his word and obeying his word to the point that you would get a standing ovation from heaven and God would just he would just stand up and say there go my son there go my daughter look how she holding to my word look how he's holding to my word and he'll cause his face to shine upon you and he'll release gifts unto me. Now, if you could be perfectly honest here and you were here and you been shooting the miss, you've been shooting in the air or you thinking you was hitting the target but you wasn't and you want the Holy Spirit to help you to, to, to increase your accuracy on hitting the target. But see, because that's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to teach you how to increase your accuracy. 